But we saw yesterday how many brand new folks we have, and this is their first Nagas conference, and we're about to do something pretty special. We're gonna spend 60 minutes with the senior leaders of the National Guard Bureau. And I'll bet that some of those young officers aren't really quite sure what the National Guard Bureau is. So as a way of introduction, I just wanna highlight the importance of the National Guard Bureau to not only the National Guard, but the Defense Department and the defense of this country. The National Guard of the several states, as you know, is under the command and control of the governors and the adjutants general, and we're responsible for training. The National Guard Bureau is the channel of communication to make sure that we fulfill our obligation and make sure that the National Guard meets the federal standard. Make no doubt about it, despite what you may have heard sometimes, there is no difference in the training standard of the United States Army and the Army National Guard or the United States Air Force or the Air National Guard. And the three gentlemen I'm about to introduce are responsible to this nation to partner with the commanders, that would be the Adjutant General, and make sure that we meet that standard. So ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to introduce the Chief of the National Guard Bureau and a member of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Frank Grass, the Director of the Air National Guard, Lieutenant General Stanley E. Clark III, and the Acting Director of the Army National Guard, Major General Judd Lyons. Please welcome them. Ladies and gentlemen, we saw yesterday with Senator Graham that tipping point, and here, a living embodiment of that tipping point, we see General McKinley in the front row and the sitting member of the Joint Chiefs and our Chief of the National Guard Bureau, General Grass, sir, the podium is yours. Well, good morning, everyone. I think it worked out pretty well this morning that we adjusted the schedule a little bit. Uh, first, let me say, Thank you to the Illinois National Guard. Where are you at? And my good friend Don Crumroy. What a great event. And also, I think there's a, a congratulations this morning to the uh, World Series Little League uh, competition coming up. I also wanted to say thank you to my mentors. And every one of the former chiefs sitting here has mentored me in some way or another in my career and continue to do that. So I want to say thank you to them and their spouses for taking time out of your schedule to be here to let these young men and women know how important the National Guard is to you, to your life, the changes you made for them, and how they need to carry that flag forward. Thank you, gentlemen. <laughs> to the former directors and deputy directors and all the great men and women that have led this National Guard over so many, so many years, 377 coming up, what, 378 years. But the ones that are here today in this very difficult time that postured this force to fight 13 years of war, thank you for what you do. So as I looked at the theme here, the National Guard, now more than ever, the first thing that jumped out at me, being a member of the Joint Chiefs, watching the daily threats, listening to what's happening in the future and how things are going to change and with the budget crisis we're in, I really think my version of this would be the National Guard, the nation and the world needs you now more than ever. So I, what we're going to do today is I'm going to run you through a few slides just to set the stage and my two good partners here. General Sid Clark, General Judd Lyons, uh, we'll have some time and, and we'll have a great dialogue, but also I encourage you to go to their breakouts because we can really get into the details about what's happening in the future and what you might expect and how you might help us keep the Guard strong. So go to the first slide. So some of you have seen this, I know the Adjutants General has seen this moniker over and over, but it really encapsulates who the Guard is today. 
We do a warfight mission for our Army and Air Force, and we are a combat reserve of that Army and Air Force, and we need to stay a combat reserve of that Army and Air Force. 767,000 mobilizations since 9-11. I just checked the numbers this morning. You think about this, after 13 years of war, 11,445 guardsmen are on station, not mobilized. If you figure how many are mobilized, either coming home or getting ready to go, it takes you up to about 15,000. But over 11,000 are stationed today in every combat operation. I say every one that this nation, this Air Force and Army has. We are on those missions today. The homeland, which is where we started and where we continue, and that's our premier mission. And we are the first military responder, as we've seen over and over and over. The numbers this morning, 4,222 4, guardsmen doing domestic operations fighting fires on the West Coast. The Southwest Border Mission we've been doing for many years. Counter drug missions going on today. Air control alert over the cities of our country by the Air National Guard. 95% of the fighters and the tankers, actually 100% of the fighters, probably 95% of the force, though, across the board, been doing that mission in support of NORAD since 1958. Go to the next slide. All right, wait, one minute, back up one. I didn't want to miss the partnerships here. The partnerships, and we have today, one of our newest partners uh, is, is the representatives from Tonga here with Nevada this morning. Nevada. <laughs> this year we entered into three new state partnerships which takes us up to 68 partners now with 74 countries. Incredible value to the nation. And it talks in there about enduring relationships and the strategic partnership we bring. This year, when Crimea started to have issues in Ukraine, inside the JCS, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs said, Frank, I need you to talk to the TAGs and see what we can do to reassure those Eastern European countries that we are going to be strong partners. We are going to continue to be partners with them. Oh, by the way, anything you can do to ramp that up. And I'm in email contact with General Phil Breedlove, NATO and European commander. And he's saying, accelerate, stay on path, keep the tasks going that you already have on the books. Uh, let's see, West Virginia took some C-5s and loaded up strikers out of Pennsylvania, two platoons, and they went into Latvia, Lithuania. And I had a call one day from Greg Vadney, TAG of Michigan, said, hey, uh, Minister and Chief of Defense want me in Latvia now. This is within the first two weeks. We reach back to UCOM, and UCOM says, yes, send them. Greg went over. What they wanted to see, what those nations wanted to have occur, was to have a U.S. general, their friend, their state partner, in the press with them to show that we have a tight relationship. And we are reassuring those partners, sending a signal to the east that we're there. Another partnership that's not on here, and I think our liaison here is from, from the uh, Homeland, uh, Home Front Command out of Israel. Are you here today? Yeah, stand up. We, thank you, thank you. We've had a, a relationship for many years with the Home Front Command, and it's a partnership, it's a bond of trust built around responding in the homeland. And our great friends in, in the National Capital Region and the, the uh, defense attache has come over twice during the issues that they're dealing with right now from Gaza. And he's briefed me about what's going on. And we're trying to learn together about responding in our homelands. And there's so much we can learn from the Home Front Command in Israel. And I really do appreciate the great support that we get. In addition to those partners, we're up to 35, I believe, 35 uh, youth challenge partners now. By the end of this year, we will have graduated 124,000 at-risk youth. And these gentlemen sitting in the first row here, and Ed Baca I had a chance to visit with, former chief as well. They all started that program, and they kept it going. 
And now we have great support from a number of folks that have left their military jobs, their civilian jobs. Where's Lou Cabrera? Lou, thank you so much. And uh, Craig McKinley, just doing some great work. Uh, we get together about once a quarter now. We pick five states and we sit down and we listen to the cadets, we listen to the program managers, and we bring the tags in. And that's been phenomenal to try to figure out how do we build this. This is an epidemic in our society where 16 and 18 year olds drop out. And I run into these men and women and I go to the schools and Pat and I have had a chance to go to some of the galas and be at some of the graduations. And I'll give you a quick story. Uh, DC National Guard had me attend their graduation most recently here in June. And I was on the stage with Mayor Vincent Gray and with the Adjutant General and the president of the University of DC. That's where we gave out the certificates. We gave out their graduation certificates. And Pat and I were looking afterwards and thinking about this, and as these young men and women came across the stage, realizing, hand, getting to shake the hand of the mayor of the District of Columbia and thanking them, and they would look at you, and it was like the first time they have ever had any recognition in their life. And the emotion that went through their eyes was phenomenal. So that's a program we got to keep going, no doubt. So I'm going to show you now what's really important about this moniker, and it's the Minuteman in the center. So this is your guard today. We're, we're building this video. We've been using this to kind of get the word out. We've got some more work to do on it, but our NCOs are doing a great job on this. And uh, when you see it, as I've traveled around the 32 states now and 11 countries, this is your guard. Roll the video. As we move into an uncertain security and fiscal future, our nation is fortunate to have today's operational National Guard. We need to maintain the gains achieved by your National Guard over more than a decade of combat experience. Put simply, the effective and affordable Guard you have today arrives on the scene at the precise right time. Well, we've made history uh, in this deployment in the, in the fact that the 146 ASOS uh, based in Oklahoma City, deployed with the 45th Infantry Brigade uh, based in Oklahoma. Uh, first time in history that's happened, and it's been uh, a great thing because of the closeness we've established. The airmen bring uh, the heavy weapons to the fight that the infantrymen don't have. Uh, since they've been here, they've dropped over 53,000 pounds of bombs uh, in multiple engagements uh, while flying over 500 sorties in support of uh, operations here in Logman Province. We're able to train at home station uh, with our counterparts in the Air Guard, and so when we do come to combat, it makes us a more effective team. These are the kinds of acts that books are written about and legends are born of. Me and uh, my squad leader, Staff Sergeant 9, actually fought our way down the trench line uh, the whole time being shot at. You really don't have time to feel anything. Uh, it's, it's not a man or a woman thing. It's, have to act like a soldier and respond like a soldier and, and that's what we did and we did that very well. In the homeland, when disaster strikes, our governors know within certainty that the guard is always there. Okay, see the retard there? Any yep. the trees? Yep. Okay, I'm gonna kick it just slightly right as we come in. Okay, ready, 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 ready. drop. Yeah, we just need to make sure we have enough time to direct fire around this corner, so anything that's gonna beat us there is what we want. The rewarding jobs that we get to do in the guard, being able to uh, to help out when you know the folks in the local community here are, are in a bad situation with the fires getting pretty close to town and to people's homes. Yesterday morning, we got a call from the uh, EOC. Uh, there was a request for action for. Uh, debris cleanup. So uh, we quickly responded and composed of uh, 15 soldiers that made up uh, two clearing teams and a lead, which is myself, uh, to assist the uh, Puna County and uh, 
civil authorities with uh, debris cleanup. What I've got the guys in the jock planning on is, okay, how do we sustain this for, for a while? But I mean, this is why I joined the National Guard, was to help the hometown. And so the second that they called me, it was, yeah, I want to go now. And the rest of the people that you'll see out here, they all had the same exact answer. And because we just want to be here uh, as much as we can. We searched in here last night, and down here we had uh, Sector 2 and Sector 4 last night. I appreciate you coming out. I mean, the beauty of being guardsmen in the state of Oklahoma is not only are we part of the, uh, the military, but we're also the neighbors of everybody that we're helping out. This is our level of confidence to step through. We've got clearance from the water company, but we've got public safety factors beyond the water company's customer base to ensure that, that we're taken care of. Yeah, I was one of the four guys that jumped from the plane, um, landed in the water. We made our way with an inflatable boat to the sailboat. Once we boarded the ship, we uh, started immediately treating the youngest daughter, the one-year-old. Your question about jumping out of a plane in the middle of the ocean, he doesn't think of that. They don't even see that. It's amazing. And the same thing with danger. They're just, that's their life, that's who they are. They are wired for it, they are trained for it, and that's why our California Guard does the incredible things we do. The stable unit structure of the Guard provides a unique tool to build enduring security partnerships across the globe. You can't surge trust and you can't surge relationships and these are relationships built over years so officers and NCOs are going up with each other, understanding each other back and forth. And since it is an enduring relationship, we see them coming to our states and visiting and learning, and then we come here. So there's not a break in this kind of relationship and training. It's a relationship uh, that's built on um, a mutual trust. Uh, it's been um, built also under fire. Um, and we have worked uh, together very, very well. And I think the strength of that relationship, as General Wood said, it's no longer a, a partnership of friends, but really um, a sense that we are one family. Because we really see this as a team effort. Uh, when disasters strike, one of the first things, one of the first options the governor has when locals need more resources is to call out the Guard. Uh, we, we work the National Guard all the time. Uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a really good pairing. You guys are great at the logistics and all that sort of stuff. We have some special capabilities that are a little bit different than what you guys have, but it's a really great partnership that's always worked really well to, to tie both, both together uh, and to get the job done. The Guard uh, provides uh, a definite need and assistance on that heavy, heavy fire, large fire support uh, role mission. Uh, water dropping, passenger troop shuttles. It's the quality of people that we have wearing this uniform an all-volunteer uniform, the citizen soldiers that we have uh, that, that really make this the greatest nation, but it's the people that wear the uniform uh, that make me ex extremely proud to serve and to serve side by side with the National Guard. From my visits with the soldiers across America and around the world, I can tell you that our successes are due to our most important resource, our people. Everyone is so supportive of their National Guardsmen. They're their friends, they're their neighbors, uh, they're their family members. Everyone knows the Guardsmen. 
Well, it was important for me personally to stay in because I wasn't ready to quit. I, I was always thought of myself as a lifer. I'd always planned to do 20 years. And when my guard unit said, you know, even though you're severely wounded, there are jobs that you can still do where you can contribute. This is an amazing honor. Honestly, um, I couldn't be more proud to be a part of the New Jersey Air National Guard. I'm receiving this award on behalf of all our EOD brothers and sisters that we have lost and for their families. So I, I thank it, and I think there's actually uh, some of the folks in the crowd here helped us produce that and did some of the interviews, so I thank you for your great support. I want to now shift gears. The good news, we have outstanding people. We have outstanding families, outstanding employers. The bad news is we have threats coming after us. Not only threats, we have a defense budget that's going down rapidly. Show you this, you can look through here, this is the future, 10 to 20 years, 30 years. This is what we're facing. We need to change with the times. We got to adjust to the threats. And I'll just highlight a couple, mega cities. The population is going to move into the cities. Think about a hurricane, a Cat 5, hitting a major populated area like New York City when Hurricane San uh, Superstorm Sandy came in. Even if you get the people out of the way, what are you going to do with 40, 50 million people that can't go back to their homes because there's no infrastructure left? We've got to deal with those. And you think about a no notice. In California, had a 6.0 this morning. That could have been a lot worse. What are you going to do in these mega cities? And we've got to be posturing for that now because we're going to be the first military responders. The other one I'll bring your attention here, which I think is a new one that's really disturbing me the more and more I hear about it as a member of the JCS and it's combating transnational organized crime. It is a worldwide problem and it affects every city, including this city right here. And you can tie, when we used to talk about drugs, you can tie the drugs to it, but the drugs is just another mechanism of getting money to do the things that they want to do to control populations and to control the amount of gangs that are in our cities. And I can go on and on about that, but that's something we've got to get at, and it's not the time to take down our counter-drug program. We ought to be expanding it into other areas right now. So if you look around here, those are the future challenges. And now I want to talk about the defense spending crisis. And you heard it yesterday, that we were postured very well. Go to the next slide. So this may not mean a lot to you, but I'm going to give you a few bullets to take away from here, because this is the fiscal reality we're dealing with. If you think of a defense budget that runs about right around a little under this year, 500 billion, the Army and Air combined, you can see the numbers here, the high was just over, uh, just over 27 billion, about 10 billion of that at the high there in 11 was Air Guard, the balance of that was Army Guard money out of the defense budget. Now we have to absorb our overseas operations into that budget at a time it's declining. And if you look at the first part of that black curve, it's going down gradual. That was Gates' efficiency. Secretary Gates knew after the war he had to take about 8% of the budget out. Historically, that's what we've done when we've come out of war. So when you look at that, that's what happened to us even before we get to the Budget Control Act. Now look at the red line at the bottom, because that is law today. And as you heard the senator talk about, if that does not get changed, it is truly going to make us a second-class military out in the 2020, 2030 time frame. We are seeing that now. You may not see it yet, but we're seeing it. And these gentlemen can tell you what's happening in their budget, and more on the Army side than others. We have to get after this Budget Control Act issue and make sure people understand, is that what the nation wants? 
Do we want to be a second class uh, military when I think the world looks to us for leadership all the time? So these are the trends you're seeing and it, they're not good. And there's some even discussing that maybe defense might need to take bigger cuts. Go to the next slide. So I just want to give you a couple of things to think about. If the Budget Control Act remains law, which it is today, this is what's going to happen to the Army Guard. We're going to have turbulence. And the current number that I've been given by the Secretary of Defense to plan for is to take the Army Guard down from 350,200, which is what we were before the war started. And what we negotiated through, you know, with the growth, we're coming down by the end of 15 to that number, 350,200. We will go to 315,000. Now, it may not sound like a lot, but you can't reach into a state and take a brigade out. You can't leave counties uncovered. So you have to move structure. We've been working this very hard with the tags. 70,000 spaces of turbulence will occur, and it'll cost the government over a billion dollars over the next five to 10 years at a time that we should, we should be dealing with all these future threats. Go to the next slide. Army restructure initiative. You know, we've agreed with the Army on giving up the Lakotas or not, I'm sorry, not the Lakotas, but the uh, Kiowa Warriors, as painful as it is, and the Tennessee Guard is fighting today, and Max has sent me many of the, the great battles his warriors are fighting. They have done great work, but the nation can't afford them anymore. So the Kiowa Warriors are going to go away. We know that. We're already building that plan. The training uh, vehicle, the TH-67 that's at the training base is aging. The Army is going to get money to buy 100 Lakotas. We are going to have 212 Lakotas, and we're going to keep 212 Lakotas in the Guard. But that's going to be the training vehicle for the future. The Apaches, if they go away, here's what's going to happen. We've been told right now to build this plan, and it will start having an impact on you in 2015. Again, I go back, though. This is a blip on the radar compared to what we're looking at in 2023. This is just the start of how this whole force is going to slowly decline in readiness, in modernization, and our ability to train our soldiers and airmen. Go to the next slide. On the Air Guard side, we talk about, and you heard yesterday about J models. I hear it every place I go. I hear about putting the latest radars in our jets. I hear about trying to get more 46 tankers. And when do we get more into the F-35? Modernization, recapitalization, and readiness of the Air Guard are going to be at the same risk. Now, the good news for the Air Guard is the commission report. Mark Welch will tell you, I will tell you, Secretary Debbie Lee James will tell you, we all learned from that report. 42 recommendations, the day it was released, we had already agreed to 36 of those. So about 86, 87 percent, we had already agreed to. And I really got to credit Mark Welch because he leaned way out ahead, brought us together, and Buddy Titshaw and Mike Edwards helped us build that plan. But I will tell you, same thing. Look out to 2023 and see what happens to your Air Force. It gets extremely ugly. Go to the next slide. Or so I think that's it. Okay, I just wanted to whet your appetite for questions for my two wonderful colleagues here and me. Give them the hard ones, I'll take the easy ones. But I would encourage you to go to their breakouts and especially you young folks, the captains. I mean, I heard a great discussion yesterday for an hour and a half where the former chiefs laid out kind of the history and some of the things they dealt with. You are the future. This is the force you're going to lead. Help us understand what our enlisted men and women and our young officers and our warrant officers and our civilians, help us understand what they're thinking out there. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So, ladies and gentlemen, a great opportunity. The mics are open. Our three senior leaders from the National Guard Bureau are here to take our questions. Looks like we have some folks moving to a mic right now. Good morning, General Grass, staff. Lieutenant Colonel Tim Hoyle, Delaware National Guard. I say Delaware National Guard, although I'm a blue suitor, I really feel joint 
And, I, and my question really speaks to some of the things that you brought up specifically about the budget. I'm from a C-130 state in the air side, and yesterday General Welsh showed a dot on his graph that showed that we had access capacity in C-130s. Clearly, uh, we're going in the direction of decrementing the fleet. The oldest C-130s in the fleet are in the National Guard. And because of that, active associates, the idea of active duty and guard units working together to share a platform to increase utilization rates aren't going forward with the C-130H models. So my question is, how do we stay relevant, how do we stay at the point of the spear when we have rapidly aging and outmoded aircraft? How do we modernize those and how do we upgrade those? And how do we ensure that we have concurrent and proportional fielding of those, of those airplanes? And I think this question speaks to not just the AMC community, but the CAF as well and cuts across board. How do we keep the guard relevant when we have outmoded and old equipment? Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'll start off and then I'll hand it over to Sid Clark. I, I want to make a, a statement for in support of General Welsh. And he's got a very tough task. And he's invited a number of us. I know Buddy Titshaw was at the, the lead end of this last corona where they bring all the four stars together. Buddy was there and Mike Edwards was there. And as we were looking at the budget of the future and modernization and the money wasn't there, it had this large red line in strategic choices. And it was across the Air Force. And not only that, there's new bills now that are coming up in space and nuclear command and control and missile defense that we need to invest because of the threat morphing. And that money's not been accounted for in a budget that's declining. And he's trying really hard to keep the Guard and the Reserve modernized keep us recapitalized, give us the readiness dollars we need. And even in one day, and I know Sid knows this because he was sitting there and, and Buddy does and so does Farmer, we were sitting there watching this and the mobility forces had a line that was below the budget. And it was probably, I don't know, 800 technicians and they were saying, we can't afford these. Mark Welch said, you will afford those, put that line up in the buyback because you are buying back those. We're not going to do that to the Guard. I've seen him, I know uh, Sid's probably seen it over and over where Mark Welch has really dedicated and he is the, the, the leading force right now to ensuring that we stay as powerful, as strong as the active Air Force and that we have the right equipment. The problem is, it goes back to the money. How do you, you can't buy when you don't have the, the resources and you can't invest in the future we're not even going to be able to do the research and development that we have that we need have to do right now. So I'll turn it over to Sid. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, the question about uh, aging aircraft and how do we stay relevant is a good one. Uh, but this isn't an Air National Guard problem. It's not an Air Force Reserve problem. It's an Air Force problem. If you look at the Air Force in inventory right now, uh, B-52s are still flying and they're likely to be flying for the next 20 years. We will have aviators in the Air Force flying B-52s. The aviators might be aged 20 to 25, and the aircraft will be somewhere closer to 80, 80 years old. Our ICBM fleet, old. A lot of munitions that back up the nuclear backbone, old. B-1s, I mean, I can go down the list, a lot of them. Now, when it gets down to the C-130s, more specifically to your question, the Air Force moved on a path of the recapitalization with J-model aircraft. We got some J-model aircraft. We're going to get some more. But the ability to recapitalize those fast enough isn't going to happen. Therefore, we have to modernize the current fleet we have to the point that they are safe, reliable, and compatible. And compatible means compatible with combatant commander missions, compatible for operations in domestic and international airspace based on mandatory rules that are coming. But make no mistake, when you hear General McDo, and I would encourage you to come and listen to him speak, talk about the reliance on the H model fleet for a variety of reasons. It does carry a lot of the tactical airlift mission that would be required both for the homeland and for the overseas mission, but also know that there's not enough J models out there to do that mission, so uh, he's going to count on the H models out there. Now, the, the required total number is different 
than what it was a couple of years ago. They've seen a drawdown in the total number required of the tactical airlift fleet. I'd say there's a variety of reasons for that. One of them might be that the C-17 is just so darn capable, it's picked up probably a share of some of the tactical airlift missions. But also, we see a reduction in the overall military size and the requirements combatant commanders have. So, moving forward, I think it's important that we get a part of the modernization effort accomplished on a pathway to recapitalization with new airplanes in the Air National Guard, in the Air Force Reserve, and the Air Force. Because all three of us got the same problem, we all got to move together on this. Good morning, John. Good morning, General Colonel Wiegan, Wisconsin Air National Guard. I have a similar question and concern for General Clark. Sir, from the senior level, level leadership from the Air Force, they're going all in to buy new F-35s. And the statements have been made that we're going to buy new and not you know, refurbish or modernize uh, the F-16 fleet. With the potential divestment of the A-10, we could have 17 uh, states in the reserve component with F-16s, yet they're cutting all uh, funding, including R&D, for CAPES uh, for the F-16 fleet. Sir, how do we go forward to make sure that we modernize that specific fleet? Okay, so you're talking about the Block 30 F-16 specifically? No, sir, pre-block, post-block, but and I don't want to make this just about the F-16s, but it, similar questions with the CAF, but the Air Force, is all in on that F-35 and not uh, really uh, putting the funding into the modernizing. Yeah. Well, I, I would tell you that uh, here's another one. We got old airplanes. Uh, we've got a pathway towards recapitalization with the Joint Strike Fighter for some of the aircraft that have to be replaced. In the meantime, it's kind of love the one you're with, so we're going to have to modernize these aircraft. I would almost tell you the same pathway on being safe, reliable, and compatible applies to the F-16s out there that we have in the Air National Guard, any aircraft for that matter. But we've got to make sure that uh, it meets combatant commander requirements. Um, the base frame of the aircraft I think is pretty good. I think the capabilities upgrades are subject to whatever money is available. General Grass just laid that out very carefully. I mean, we live in a world of reduced funding. And I, I, would, I would argue that what General Grass pointed out on the BCA funding, not only is it law, uh, but it happened in a problem that's actually out there that's even bigger than the one we're facing right now. Sequestration actually only took a problem that's out there and brought it to us a little bit closer. So the available dollars that we have now and possibly in the future, I think it's going to be trouble. Maybe we'll fix sequestration. The problem of the nation's debt is still out there. The problem of the mandatory spending is still out there. It's going to crush discretionary spending to the point that with or without DCA, I think we still have a problem coming as a nation. We just have to face up to that reality. Specifically to force structure, including the fighters, we're going to try to buy as many of the Joint Strike Fighters as we can to replace the airplanes we have. In the meantime, we're going to have to continue to make sure that those airplanes that we're flying, love the one you're with, are able to do the missions of the combatant commanders. Indeed, all of our units out there are being, still being mobilized and counted on in a heavy way to do mission sets for the Air Force, for the nation. So I think we're going to continue to see some upgrades, some modernization efforts, but we're not going to recapitalize fast enough to have everybody have new airplanes out there. It's just not going to happen. Unless something happens tremendously different than what's happening in the budget right now, I don't see that. If I could, I just want to talk a little bit about what has really happened with the budget and macro levels that, that's creating all the stress. Uh, I talked about the Gates cuts. If you total up the Gates cuts with what the Budget Control Act will do, we will take out over 18 percent of the defense budget from what we had in a, probably about 2000 and without the OCO in 2011. About uh, $1.2 trillion will be have gone out of the defense budget over about a 10-year period by 2023. $1.2 trillion. Thank you, sir. General Grass, uh, staff. This is uh, Captain Paul Seaver with the Illinois National Guard. I currently serve as a dual status technician in the Illinois National Guard. And it's my understanding that the fiscal year 2012 National Defense Authorization Act 
required a report on the termination of the military technician as a specific management category. I'm wondering if there's any uh, updates on that report and also if there's a plan on how the uh, National Guard will continue its full-time staff if the military technician is terminated. Mr. Luger. Could you say that again? I don't think I heard the question quite right. Oh, I apologize, sir. The, this is in reference to the fiscal year 2012 National Defense Authorization Act. The uh, Authorization Act required a report on the termination of the military technician as a specific management category. And I, I'm wondering if there's any updates on that study or that report, and if there's a plan to continue uh, National Guard full-time staffs without a military technician if that classification is terminated. Yeah, I'm, I'm not familiar with it. I don't, we're not planning on terminating. So, sir, this was uh, in the law of 2012. It mandated a review of the, specifically the dual status technician program. And the study has been released, if I could uh, share and, uh, and maybe you comment. The study concluded that by and large the dual status technician program of the National Guard should be continued. It did say that there might be some areas uh, that are not necessarily tied to the military function, which is what the report thought was key, the dual status technician, that being a technician and your role as a guardsman tied together. And the report suggested that perhaps some of the functions that were inherently administrative or perhaps inherently federal without the nexus to the National Guard of the several states, they might be converted to something different. But I can, I can uh, send you, it's gonna to go to Congress. It hasn't been reported to Congress yet. It's just been released and on its way to Congress. Thank you, sir. Thank, thanks, Don, for that clarification. I, I will tell you the value of our technicians is, is critical, especially when you talk about the maintenance of our force, the administration of our force. We've got to have the technician program. And in, as I look at what happened, and, and I really do apologize to every technician, every dual status technician in the room, every uh, Title V that had to go through the furlough, and the non-dual status technicians, that furlough was very difficult on you. And we think, and we've talked a number of times with the adjutant general, that we have to change. When a dual status technician is required to be in a military unit and required to wear a uniform to work, that they should be exempt from furlough. And I know there's some work going on to do that. Let me, let me throw in another piece here on the dual statics technician program. And it's one that's kind of missing from some of the conversation we have. And the Air Force is getting ready to initiate an inside study on how many uh, full-time personnel we have and in the appropriate places, whatever. I'm not worried about that at all. We're going to kill this one because I can tell you the value of the dual status technician program over and over again. Indeed, it kind of surfaced during the uh, furlough, program, uh, furlough time period. But the, the key points on the, the dual status technician program for me is what value it is to how efficient we run our organizations, particularly with regard to training new people when they come into the unit. So my son-in-law just joined the Kentucky Guard Air Guard. He's just got to Lackland Air Force Base this week. Uh, so I told him, don't worry about the weather in San Antonio in August. It's perfect 4 a.m. in the morning when they're going to wake you up every day. So enjoy it. <laughs> but when, when, when Jake, my son-in-law, finally returns from all of his training to be a C-130 crew chief, who's going to make sure he trains to be a full-up partner in that unit when he gets there? Well, by golly, the dual status technicians who are around there day to day running that place will make sure that he's able to do that. And a lot of the part-time people that come into work on drill weekends are previously experienced people who separated from the U.S. Air Force who don't have to be trained on anything. They've got it. And they will be training Jake simultaneously. That is so unique to the Department of Defense but we don't really talk about it much. But the value of that is very tangible and I'm going to make sure that they know it. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Morning, sir. Colonel Fitzgerald from uh, Oregon. Question for General Clark. Uh, in light of the fiscal challenges that uh, you've mentioned, uh, 
Uh, how do you see that affecting the standing up of active associations? Yeah. Well, the active associations that we had, um, particularly on things like C-130, it was discussed earlier, when the Air Force is moving on to uh, an LJ model fleet, they still have some H model C-130s in Yokota, uh, they looked at us and said, you know, we're not going to be able in a BCA structured funding program to keep the active associations alive because we won't have a need for as many people flying C-130H models. Okay, fair enough. Uh, this affected the Air Force Reserve in a bigger way. They lost uh, more active associations via this problem. But um, it's sad because we have great opportunities to socialize between the total force and these active associations. Moving forward, we're supposed to put some into the fighter forces, and I think that that may happen uh, over time. But the power of the active association should not be understated. In fact, I think of all the TFI things we do, and all the things that I've done, all the things I've seen, I think the active association is very, very powerful, whereby the unit-equipped Air National Guard units will take on active duty members and let them fly the airplanes with them. And it's additive embedded. I really don't care. Sometimes one works better than the other, depending on the MDS. But the power of that is that you have the ability to do things like two-shift maintenance. You have the ability to get out the door quickly with the lead uh, UTC or package, if you will, for combat operations. Time and time again, I'm very convinced when I see these active associations, how good they are. But that underlying thing of actually having a relationship with each other, and indeed, if we're going to have a future chief of staff of the Air Force have significant experience with a reserve component, the active association is one I want to see. If I could add, uh, let's see, Ohio, is uh, Colonel Baker here this morning? <laughs> Colonel Baker is an active duty officer commanding the 180th Fighter Wing who has an alert mission, who has the normal support the combat air forces, and he was picked by the Air Force to command a guard wing. General Mike Hostage, Sid and I have talked, within the next two years, we're going to pick a colonel of the Air National Guard, one of our best, and we're gonna put them in command of an active wing. We've already committed to this. These are the kind of relationships that we need in our Army and our Air Force. Air Force is leading the charge right now, but I've proposed multi-component units like this where we really get to know each other better. And I know that Judd can tell you this, but the alignment we have right now with our divisions and our brigades, as they train together, we've had active duty commanders come up to us and say, this is some of the best training we've ever had. We get to grow together, we learn together. And I think, you know, the Air Force really started this, and we got to build upon this. Thank you, sir. An Army question? General Lyons, is that okay? I'm here. Yes, sir. <laughs> so my question is, a lot of uh, discussion, challenges in the Army budget that I know you're familiar with, sir. Um, and we're going to hear from General McMasters, who's sort of the architect for 2025. As we look down the road and you see the budget challenges we face and the potential for the new Arfordgen to take the Army formations to company level of the few, maybe platoon level for everybody else, it demands that we have a sufficient generating force to move from that level to BCT level to go overseas for the fight. But it would seem like the budget cuts are going to reduce that generating force and make that awfully difficult. And my question to you is, do you think that's a challenge for national defense as we go forward? Yeah, thanks, Don. Uh, I do see some specific challenges for the Army National Guard as we look ahead here. You know, the near-term issue that we're facing is the budget impacts in FY15 in particular, so I'll address that first. Particularly as you compare it and contrast it with FY14, the current fiscal year we're in. So we will see in FY15 uh, a budget impact of 
about a billion dollars with a B uh, less in FY15 as compared to where we are in FY14. And we'll see that manifest itself, the impacts of that one billion dollars less in, in a number of areas. Uh, we will see uh, incredible pressure in our pay and allowance account that in the aggregate appears to be only about a $93 million shortfall in 15. But when you balance that against the increased number of guardsmen and women that are attending drill, attending the annual training, our participation rate is what we call it, is going up. And that, that's, that's good. Our men and women want to be at drill, they want to be at annual training, they want to be engaged. But when you take a $93 million reduction in PNA, pay and allowance, to pay for that increased participation rate in drill and AT, it hits us in some other areas that gets to your question, specifically within schools and special training. We see significant impact coming in FY15 in those areas. And so we will see a corresponding readiness level reduction associated with that. So for the vast majority of the Army National Guard in FY15, we will be funded at individual, crew, and squad level readiness. We have two brigade combat teams that are scheduled for CTC rotations in FY15. Uh, with uh, congressional marks, we have the, uh, assuming that comes forward, we have the pay and allowance and O&M to support those two rotations. Uh, so for those two brigade combat teams, uh, one heavy, one light, uh, they will come out of that at company level proficiency. We will continue to have our exportable combat training capability, XCTC, rotations. But again, the pressure in both O&M and P&A to support those rotations, we will feel that in 15. So XCTC allows those brigade combat teams to have platoon level proficiency. But the pressures in P&A will, will impact us in that. L let's talk about O&M for a second. Operations and maintenance in FY15, as compared to 14, is $826 million less. That will manifest itself directly in readiness producing areas. Uh, that will hit us in our base operation systems, sustainment restoration and modernization accounts, our medical readiness that right now we're at a historic high. We lead all three components in our medical readiness. But those types of budget reductions will erode that readiness over time. Our duty MOSQ, which is also in the Army National Guard at a historic high for duty and most qualified soldiers in paragraph and line numbers for which they're trained. We will see budget pressure in 15 against our ability to maintain that duty and most qualification rate. It's about a 30% reduction. So as we look ahead in the out years in 16 through 20, under Budget Control Act pressures, those pressures are going to continue to hit us in those readiness areas where we bring capability and capacity to the Army. So we're going to be as innovative and adaptive as we can be within those budget constraints to continue to deliver training opportunities, but we're going to have to approach this fundamentally differently and recognize that our readiness in the Army National Guard, particularly in 15, will be significantly impacted. This is first for Judd. I'm, I've got about a three-part question here. You just talked about readiness. And one of the recent statements out of the Army is that we are so ready, we feel like we're paying you too much and we need to cut that budget. So I can't emphasize enough for all the folks in here that that innovation, that way that we look at training our warriors is so important. 
because we can do it better than the Army. The next thing that I would like to ask you is, you know, on the Air Force side and the Air National Guard side, we look at those places where we can have an active associate or we can have an active duty commander in charge of a fighter wing. How are we going to do that with the Army? Thanks, Bill. Uh, you know, I think in terms of, uh, of Army Guard, Army approach to training, I, I do think it's important to, to highlight uh, some successes we've had there, and that's an Army Total Force Policy implementation. Uh, so I, I, I'm going to, I'll get to your second piece in just a second here, but I do want to highlight some successes that we've had in partnering with first U.S. Army and Forces Command in getting at that home station training that you're talking about, and that's through, for example, our XCTC program. Uh, I had the opportunity recently to go to Idaho and see the uh, 116th Armored Brigade Combat Team train at XCTC, and that was a manifestation of innovation and adaptiveness and capitalizing on partnerships that allowed us to deliver some incredible training capacity. So in, in Gowan Field, you had the 116th, uh, Montana, Oregon, and Idaho. Training on the ground, 2,000 plus soldiers underneath that BCT commander. You had First Army provided uh, a complete suite of observer controller trainers. And that, that team of OCTs will remain with the 116th as they go through their NTC rotation next year in summer of 15. So those partnerships continue to develop. Joint Base Lewis McCord brought um, 400 plus soldiers to Orchard Training Center in Idaho and line hauled 69 striker vehicles and other tactical vehicles from the active component to perform the opposing force mission for the 116th commander. So the net result of that was the 116th at the end of their XCTC from a total force policy implementation and that partnership that General Grass talked about, about COMPO 1, COMPO 2, and COMPO 3 partnering together is going to result in the 116th having platoon level proficiency, live fire, table 12, gunnery qualified for both Bradley's and the brand, uh, brand new Abrams tanks and staff proficiency as they're postured to go into FY15 for a CTC rotation. So that's, that's the partnership uh, that we can have uh, with the Army to deliver that training uh, in, in better ways. So to the, uh, the multi-compo uh, question, we are exploring multi-component solutions both to training and also to structure. The most significant manifestation of that right now for the Army National Guard is in our divisions. We are exploring the opportunity to have a main command post uh, organization, Army National Guard, that would be tied into an active component division. Uh, this, is, uh, this is new territory for us, uh, not without its challenges. Um, We've had uh, the state of Wisconsin uh, and uh, reach back into our significant military intelligence capabilities in uh, states like Utah, uh, California, uh, and other states to try and explore those opportunities to get at multi-component solutions so that as the budget drives down, we can capitalize on each other's strengths. So we got to continue to peel the onion back. We have to be open to new ideas to explore those. Uh, uncover the warts and the challenges and try and get at them, uh, but demonstrate that our Army National Guard in 2,600 communities is pretty well postured to bring those kinds of capacity and capability to our Army. And I, I just think we, uh, we need to continue to explore those. We should explore and be open to the idea of uh, accepting uh, active component uh, 
soldiers into our formations uh, and vice versa. Uh, we will see when we hear from Lieutenant General Tucker in the Army breakout the opportunity for uh, guardsmen to perhaps have battalion command opportunities within First Army. Those are significant steps forward, I think, in a multi-component approach to training and delivering capability and capacity. So long-winded answer, Bill, uh, uh, but I hope that helps. It, it does, and you know, the one fi 197 Fires Artillery Brigade, which belongs in New Hampshire, just did a multi-compo XHC at Grayling. We had the active duty, the Guard and Reserve. So we get, always have to look at those opportunities. Yeah, and I, I highlighted the 116th, uh, the Fires Brigade is one, 72nd BCT, um, you know, 53rd BCT, you know, every single XCTC rotation that we have executed or plan to execute are going to have a multi-component flavor to them, both from training and from the assets that come to bear, both from the Guard and, and the active component in the USAR. Thanks. The last question is both for General Clark and yourself, and let's talk about cyber, both in the Army side and on the Air National Guard side. And where do you see we go? Where do we go in the future about that? That was for both of us, right? Correct. Okay. Uh, well, we are creating more uh, cyber squadrons in the Air National Guard, and to help fill out the requirement for the CPTs, and we're going to use rotation. What? It's hard to explain how we do this with a largely part-time force to people who are not as familiar with the National Guard and how we accomplish our mission sets with the people. Uh, but we're slowly working this in in different ways and explaining it to people so that they will be more readily acceptable to putting more force structure in the Guard with, with the cyber mission set. You heard General uh, Welsh yesterday. I mean, essentially, if you boiled down his comments about what he wants out of cyber is he's not interested in doing mission sets where we're tracking human activities and that time he said that's somebody else's job what he's interested in when it comes to uh, computer network defense and maybe some of the other mission sets that might be somewhat more offensive he's uh, keyed on what supports our combined uh, air component commanders out there who are tasked with the air responsibilities and how does that best help him or her do their mission set, and then how would that help the combatant commander? So that's how he's kind of focusing his efforts and the Air Force on it. Um, the one thing I will tell you, Bill, and it's, this is for any mission set, no conversation in the Pentagon ever starts with, you can't get that out of the Air National Guard. You can't get them to do something. You can't train them well enough to do something, never has that discussion ever come up. They're all in agreement that that can happen. We just have to prove how we do it efficiently and effectively with a different force structure than possibly what they're used to seeing. The power of us being involved in things like the Cyber Guard exercises, and we bring in people from OSD, the Joint Staff, and others to come watch how the Guard is involved with that, actually meet members of the Air National Guard, probably the Army National Guard, to see how they're involved with those type of things uh, based on largely civilian skill sets that they have and experience to do these mission sets and train others to do it and then get together either at drill and other places to polish that, but the day-to-day -day operations and the ability to put the mandates in and rank, crank up the rheostats on those units when you need them, when they're gonna be a part of the, the force structure uh, operationally day-to-day -day is very, it's very capable, and I think there's a recognition of that. So it's, it's a slow process. Our desire has outpaced the ability of an institution like the Department of Defense to accept us in these mission sets. But we're getting there. They're starting to see it more and more, and they're going, I think this is the right way. And I've heard people in OSD policies and others say, we get it. The National Guard can do this mission set. How much of it we're going to get, we're going to keep working at it. But we have to prove ourselves we have to prove ourselves in every mission set for that matter. And we are a proven force. That's one of the war fighting parts that General Grass was talking about in that, that uh, three wedges of a pie as a proven force for war fighting and the first choice for homeland operations. We continue to do that day in and day out. We're not doing that. The people out here and the people that work for you are doing that. 
And it's, it's quite remarkable to watch when you go in these exercises and, and get introduced to these people. I've heard that not only are they proud of the fact that they can take people who uh, will leverage civilian skill sets in cyber, that's a big plus right there in itself, but also the fact that we have institutions that will respect us and trust us because they're out there in the field, not in uniform doing things. So it's kind of a, a, a double on that. And the third part of that is the ability to have a place to capture the cyber expertise that's separating from the regular military into the guard and put them back to work doing these cyber things. And we'll end up with, like many other things we do, the most experienced and the most capable force structure that's offered up to the Department of Defense to do this mission set. So Bill, I'll give you a quick update uh, on Army Guard cyber initiatives. Uh, a couple of key things have happened here. Uh, in April, uh, I signed a memorandum of agreement with Lieutenant General Cardone, who is U.S. Army Cyber Command commander. Uh, that did a, a couple of things for us in the Army National Guard. Number one is it codified in that document uh, some mission sets for the one Title X ADOS cyber protection team that we've stood up in the Army National Guard. Uh, outline mission sets for that team. It also uh, expressed the desire to continue to explore uh, our professional education center in Little Rock, Arkansas as a training venue for advanced uh, cyber training that right now uh, is, is executed through one, one particular stovepipe. So if we can expand that capability at PEC, uh, that will benefit not only the Army National Guard, but other services. Uh, so the MOA signing was very important. Our Title X ADOS team is stood up. It's fully manned. It's at basic level training proficiency and is now trying to explore those advanced training courses that the cyber protection teams need. So that's a significant effort. We also recently uh, had our concept plan for that team approved by the Army, signed off by uh, the DAG-3. That codifies the, re the organizational structure of that team, and that's a significant step forward in the staffing process. As we look to our traditional Guard teams, we're going to stand up 10 of them. They will be structured exactly like the Army's cyber protection teams both in terms of MOSs and capability and mission sets. That concept plan is also in the staffing process in the Department of the Army. We hope to see that approved very soon. Again, that will codify those 10 teams. And it's very important, this is something that we continually stress, is that those 390 positions, 10 teams at 39 soldiers each, are already captured within our end string. So this is not additional growth. And that removes a barrier, an argument against those teams. So once we get the approval for that concept plan, then we will solicit nomination packages from the 54 states, territories, and the district, and go through a process to determine stationing of those teams. So that's the next step. Uh, so that's kind of the update on where we are in the uh, Army Guard. Bill, if, if I could add, I want to thank you for your support of the Cyber General Officer Steering Committee. I know you've been very active in that. Uh, we have some great tools here and an ability to reach in and get information from the state, definitely through Bill. We also have with me, uh, I think in the crowd here, is uh, Air Guard Colonel, Colonel Tim Lunderman, who is my liaison to uh, Cyber Command. We have a Major General Tom Thomas, great American out of Delaware that's been uh, at Cyber Command for, for well over two years now. I've had three meetings, engagements with DHS, FBI, and it was run by Cybercom with Admiral Rogers in place. Admiral Rogers told me that uh, he, he knows the Guard. You wonder how does, a, how does a Navy Admiral know the Guard? His father spent 27 years in the Guard. So he's been to the Armor, he knows what it's about. So I think we have some partners, and, and Eric Rosenbach, the soon to be Hopefully it will get confirmed and be the HD, the, the Homeland Defense Assistant Secretary, who's now the cyber policy. We've sent him out to Kansas and saw the Fusion Center. We've sent him out to Washington. And the tags that are here know this. At our Cyber Guard exercise, 
at the end of the exercise, when a number of tags were there, he said, I want to talk to him. Went in an auditorium, turned the chair around, sat down, and said, I need to hear from you. And the governors have come on loud and clear about this as well. So I think we're on a good path. We're building it together. As uh, both my colleagues here said, uh, you know, building it in line with our federal mission will allow us to do that state mission. And the guidance I've given both Sid and Judd is that our goal is to have a cyber unit of some type in every state. Thank you, sir. We have time for one more question, and we have a soldier waiting patiently on the left. We'll give you the last question. And gentlemen, this is Captain Chamberlain with uh, Arizona Guard. Uh, as we have struggled to get platoon level uh, proficiency in the past, trying to get to multi-echelon training centers at CTC or warfighters. Uh, you were talking about the limited resources being the way ahead. Do you anticipate the Arphogen cycle changing for the Garden Reserve component to you know, try to get to that platoon level proficiency? I do see Arphogen adapting. Uh, I think that uh, that is, a, uh, that is a wave of the future in terms of uh, the application of generating forces and how we've done it in the past and what the demand and supply is for the future. So I think uh, we will see Arphogen adapt over time here. Uh, the one consistent thing that, that we try and stress is the need for CTC rotations, however, in whatever construct from a progressive training strategy model we adopt, uh, both from a leader development standpoint uh, and from a readiness generating standpoint uh, to get those formations to company level proficiency. Uh, our challenge is uh, the fiscal reality of those CTC rotations and trying to build progressive training so that you're postured to execute those. Uh, right now, we are scheduled for two and 15, as I said. We anticipate probably two and 16, 17, 18, 19. We would like to see that at three. We'd like to see three CTC rotations for the Army Guard. Um, we're not there yet. Uh, so the challenge for us and for those company commanders out in the audience and those first sergeants, battalion commanders, and CSMs is in IDT training and your culminating training events of annual training is what level of proficiency are you able to generate out of those training events and how are you resourced to do that? Um, and those are friction points. Uh, but we have to be postured at the end of the day that if we get three CTC rotations or we have two CTC rotations, that we have those formations, and it's not just the brigade combat teams, it's enablers. Uh, we have a, a wide variety, vast number of enablers that support CTC rotations for all components, not just our brigade combat teams. So there's training opportunities there for us, uh, and we just have to be postured to execute those. Um, but I see Arfergen adapting over time here. And I don't know if General McMaster is going to talk about that or not, um, but I see that as, as definitely something the Army is taking a hard look at. Thank you, sir. Well, I want to thank uh, all of our distinguished uh, guests for this wonderful panel. I'd like to give General Grass a chance to wrap up. Sir, you have any final comments for us? Just on behalf of General Clark and General Lyons and myself, uh, please thank your soldiers and airmen 463,000 strong that do tremendous work every day. And I, I get a chance to visit them, and I'm so fascinated, and I've been in for a few years. This is the best force. We've always had great people, but now we have great people, tremendous experience in our leadership, the dedication. These men and women know exactly what they're stepping into when they enlist today. And not only that, right now we do have the resources what we wanted to present to you today is where we're headed to the future, and we need everybody's help so that our nation doesn't go down this path. So thank you again for the opportunity, and go Army. <laughs>